evening, Waxahachie Chamber of Commerce. This is Heidi Hood, your marketing manager at Waxahachie. Well, and really, I guess we're talking to all of Waxahachie right now. We've got a very large audience uh, tonight. So I uh, wanted to introduce to you our special guest uh, of Noel Carmen with Discovery Point Retreat. We are uh, interviewing every week live at 6 o'clock on Tuesdays to uh, help our community and business owners, employees, and everybody kind of rebound, especially when it comes to mm -hmm. mental health and wellness. So uh, Discovery Point Retreat actually is one of our chamber members. They provide a lot of support in that regard. And I'll let Noel share a little bit about that and introduce our special guest for you tonight. So, Noelle, would you take it away? Thank you, Heidi. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome, as Heidi said, to our weekly mental health and recovery series. Today, we are talking with Jackie Watson, and what we're talking about is something that's really complex. Um, it's the family system within recovery and addiction. Uh, but before we get started, as always, I want to reach out to all of you and make sure that you know if you are struggling with addiction, if you are struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with depression, please don't feel like you have to do that alone. You have Discovery Point Retreat in, in Ellis County, Waxahachie, and Ennis. Like I say, always right in your backyard. The number is 855-916-3289. Don't be afraid to reach out. We have counselors. We have all kinds of help waiting at the end of that phone call. Um, okay, so Jackie, thank you so much for being here. Um, Jackie, you are a wife who is in a marriage where you and your husband had to deal with addiction over many years. And it's why I wanted to talk to you because the significant part and a lot of times what the addict themselves don't realize is how much their behavior affects everyone else in the system. That's mom, that's dad, that's wife, that's children. Um, and that's the part that I want to talk about. And it isn't just with addiction. It's all encompassing in terms of codependence and how we need each other in ways that actually enable able each other to do things that are unhealthy. Um, so before we get into all of that, can you tell us what your role at the Avenue Church is uh, and give us a little bit of um, feedback as to where you are right now? Absolutely. Um, I was attending the Avenue for a few years when they started, well, when I heard about Celebrate Recovery back in 2017. They had just started a group for friends and family of the addict, um, which was on the heels of our big, um, just our big climax of our struggle. And I decided to go. Um, I mean, I hit the ground running, going to open shares. And since then, I've done um, three 12 steps. I have led open share groups. I'm actively sponsoring other women. That's um, and I serve, yeah, I serve as our Celebrate Recovery Encourager coach on our team. And I also volunteer in um, the youth program as an open share leader for junior high girls. And that's called The Landing. So um, addiction usually starts when we're children, meaning that some element of it becomes comfortable to us um, in our growing up years, in our formative years. So can you take us back to the things that you can see now as an adult that made those things comfortable uh, for you now um, and as you were beginning a relationship with your husband or other relationships? Yeah, um, quite honestly, I grew up um, as the daughter of an alcoholic father. Um, my parents were very, my mother is not an, an addict. I don't struggle with addiction. It's not something that I'm familiar with myself. Um, but their relationship was, uh, they kept everything pretty hidden from us kids. We, we considered ourselves pretty lucky looking back. Um, he just kind of did his own thing. Alcohol was just always present when he was home. It wasn't really brought to our attention um, until I found um, some marijuana in the dryer when doing laundry, and that was the final straw for my parents' marriage. So up to that point, it was pretty contained. Mm -hmm. 
in my exposure, I felt was very limited and controlled and pretty normal. Um, so looking back, does it surprise you or did it at some point, because it felt so removed, did it surprise you to realize you had accidentally, um, just by being around it, picked up um, things that were comfortable with regards to addiction that you brought into your adult life? Would you describe that as accurate or what's your take on that? Man, I really, I think I'm pretty prideful. Um, we grew up, obviously, and we, we dabbled in alcohol before we were of age. Um, we just never, it was never um, an addiction thing. We never let it get mm -hmm. to us. So I feel like whenever I met my husband, and he was pretty upfront about his struggles with alcohol um, previously, uh, he was just coming out of paying off a D DWI whenever we met. Um, he was so different than my father that I thought maybe he had outgrown his addiction or his struggle or his problem. I don't think at that point either one of us would have said he is an alcoholic or he struggles with addiction or he is an addict. I think both of us would say, you know, he had self-control issues or or whatever, you justify it away because he was night and day from the man that I knew um, as my father to the man that I would later marry. Uh, so I, I think this is so interesting because um, any of us who've dealt with codependence or addiction, there's this sense of like denial, like that's the other. That isn't something that defines me in any way. So would you see that, and you and I had spoken just a little bit about how we kind of whitewash things or we don't see what's really in front of us. Is that how you would describe kind of what was going on there? Absolutely. I mean, Tim and I didn't date very long, so we didn't, we didn't know each other's darknesses or um, really how to, to deal. I mean, I, was, I had just turned 21 when we started dating, so alcohol was on the scene. Right. Um, and it was, he was 25, so he was a little bit older, but I mean, you just, you just kind of live. It was what was socially acceptable. Right. We were both servers, so that was kind of the mm -hmm. atmosphere of everything. Um, I don't think we were comfortable enough to say, and I, I think you drink too much, or I think this will be a problem later on. It was something that we just enjoyed together, and we thought we were naive enough to think that we could control it. Quite honestly. At, at which point did you start to see, hey, this is a this is a problem. Something's not right here. Um, where did the whitewashing stop um, and all of a sudden reality is hitting? Um, we were married for a while. Uh, we had had probably both of our girls, I think, um, whenever I started noticing some some differences. Like I had, I obviously had to quit drinking um, for pregnancy, so it wasn't something that was difficult for me. And through the first pregnancy, he had also quit, and it was something that we did together. Um, but I mean, once you start building that family, and you you struggle, you struggle as a young married couple. And he was the only one working. Um, there was other situations, um, some family conflict going on that was really coming to a peak after. My second daughter was born, and I think that's where it became an everyday occurrence. And it wasn't like blackout drunk or drinking um, till he passes out. Tim was a very functioning alcoholic his entire drinking stint. Um, it was just something that I noticed that he depended on, and it was always present. So this idea of a functional alcohol alcoholic, excuse me, is really interesting because um, from your perspective, if someone's functioning, what's the problem? For Tim, it was that he didn't know when he had had enough. His whole, his whole voice would change. Um, the way he approached things, he would become very fun and outgoing. And the issue became when he would... Um, make some reckless decisions. Like if he wants to get behind the wheel of a car and he feels confident, but I know he's had too much. That's a real big problem. That's a huge red flag, obviously. 
Um, but it would come out in different things where he would he would just spot out be in denial or lie and say, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I, you're obviously stumbling. Um, he showed up to church, Christmas service, drunk one night, didn't come in until the very end. And he was swaying with my newborn baby in his hands. And he was fine. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was fine. Yeah. Um, but he was still present. He was always a great father. He was never an angry alcoholic. So he could function. He just was reckless and a danger to my children, especially, but other people if he was driving. So if he was functioning, do you feel like that part of it made it take a lot longer for you to see and address um, as opposed to um, some alcoholics who, you know, just absolutely fall apart, have lost everything. Did that create a longer period before you, you actually addressed the problem? Um, no. I'm, I'm very quick to um, confront him. I'm comfortable in that. And it was common sense to me. Like, you're a danger. This is this should be clear as day. I shouldn't be having this conversation with you, especially in regards to you have children who are dependent on you. I'm dependent on you. You missed a church service. Like he, he went that night and I said, you go talk to a pastor or you stay in the parking lot, but do not come home. Like, oh, wow. This is a problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So and you, were, did. you were good at boundaries then. So his response as you started creating those boundaries was positive. You felt like he was responsive. So um, did all, it was did all of this forth. resolve quickly then? Hey, husband, here are the issues. Go take care of it. Taken care of. So done. It, I mean, it didn't play out that way exactly. Oh, no. No, no. Um, and in that time... There had been, um, like at the church time, we had already had our son, which meant that Tim had already transitioned from a manager of a local restaurant to a bartender at a family sports bar in Dallas. And so, um, yes, he was providing and he was coming home mostly sober. Um, he was present in all of those things um, for a while. He was one of one of the requirements because I, I did have a come to Jesus meeting with his family and said, hey, um, this conflict is is making him drink more. I'm not saying that you're responsible, but I'm saying that the conflict is heavy on him and this is how he's coping, um, which they didn't respond to well. But in their effort to uh, help me out, I think we all pushed him in the Celebrate Recovery direction. And so at that point, he did begin a recovery program, but he did not utilize it correctly. And unbeknownst to me, he was showing up um, intoxicated many of the nights that he would go. And it was just to appease me, to get me off of his back, to show that he's making progress, um, that he's doing the right things. Um, but I don't think his drinking ever really stopped um, because he had free access. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't paying for it. It wasn't costing us anything other than, you know, his character, quite honestly. So was this a surprise to you or were you were you aware of what was going on? Because essentially um, as in addiction, a lot of times in order to protect the addiction, the addict lies or they they keep it a secret um so at which point did you realize oh hold on i didn't realize this was happening but now i know yeah um you know we had gone through seasons of sobriety um, but he was very clear that he didn't want to impose his restrictions on me so it was it was a weird codependency on his part that he um, wanted he didn't want to change my life but he was you know trying to maintain his sobriety so in allowing me to drink I think I let my guards down kind of eventually um, where where I accepted his drinking and I thought it was it was manageable um, and we could control it and he would make better choices um, because actually when he was working at the bar he had 
he had been convicted of his second DWI, but nothing had happened. Um, he had been pulled over with some guy back when we, when our first daughter was born and they ran his plate and he had an at large warrant for a previous accident that he had had before we were married. And so he, you know, he did the right thing and said, yes, I was guilty of that. And so he had his second one. And so fast forward to the bar, like surely he wouldn't risk this. Like right. you would be smart enough to know your limit or to at least not get behind the wheel to get busted for your third DWI. Um, and I remember him coming home a few times and I could just look at him and he would just stand there with like a real steely eyed look and not make eye contact and just kind of sway. And I was like, look, I know something's going on with you. Um, I wish you would come talk to me before God intervenes. And this is a bigger problem than what we can handle. And he would just look at me and say, no, everything's fine. Um, it's under control. Um, I just had a beer and a shot when I was doing my checkout from shift because he worked at that time. He was working day shift. Um, Did like you believe him? Five. Did you believe him at this point? Or, uh, I mean, was that okay with you at that point? No, um, which was, it was a big conflict for us. But at some point, I just had to let it go or it was going to ruin the time that we had together and our family time. And if he can sober up and he made it home, um, I had to, to put some sort of trust in him or just kind of let it go for my own sanity. I was a stay-at-home mom with three kids under the age of six. Yeah, like yeah. I have to think that you're smart enough to responsible enough that you are grown enough to have these same thoughts that I do. Um, but once again, I'm not an addict and his brain is. So it was, it was unrealistic of me to let that go, but that's what we did to just get by. So we're talking about family systems. So this was, this had to have been tearing you apart slowly. Um, just knowing at least somewhere in your mind, this is going to bottom out at some point. So when did that happen? Yeah. So when I confronted him um, about the, hey, I know something's going on, it would be two weeks later, um, December 16th. That Right and early that morning, he had been working a bar shift um, December 15th. This is 2016. Um, and I had talked to him at 2 a.m. He was closing. And I said, hey, you know, are you okay? Is everything all right? He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm checking out. I'll be home soon. I'll be on my way. I said, okay. And I wake up at 6 to start to get my kids ready for their Christmas uh, parties at school. And it was, a, I think it was a Friday. So it was the last day. They were very excited. And I'm like, man, he should have been home by now. And I get a phone call. And it's real real difficult to understand but it's Tim and he says I'm so sorry I'm so sorry and I said what and he said I was in an accident and I said okay are you okay and he was like yeah uh, you know he's just real kind of hard to understand and I said are you in an ambulance and he said yes and um, I said okay we're on our way and so um, we do a scramble to find out which hospital he's gone to because we don't know where the accident was. And it turns out as I'm loading up my kids in their pajamas and whatever we can throw on real quickly, um, it was a mile and a half from my house. He had rolled his car off the side of 77 and I was passing all of the emergency responders pulling his vehicle out while heading up to Dallas um, to go find him. And they let me in and... Um, it was an immediate, like, I don't think it had occurred to me that it was an accident based on alcohol. I thought maybe he was tired. It was 4 a.m. He had worked a long shift. Um, but walking in and seeing him in the neck brace, it was just an immediate cloud of alcohol that you could smell. And he was fine. So he had a bandage on his head. He had scalped himself a little bit. Um, and the nurse said he bled quite a bit. Um, but then he was fine. Everything was was turning out okay. Um, but that was the moment when kind of everything compounded like 
we're in it now. Like, I know the police have seen his vehicle. I know where you stand legally. This will be your third. Um, and he was just so out of it and so unaware of what was happening. I remember him wanting to see the kids so bad. And I was like, you have to get cleaned up. Yeah. You're, you're, I, I don't think that's a good idea. And he kept persisting and kept persisting. And so I went and got my kids in the waiting room. And I, I looked him dead in the face and said, hey, that's still your daddy. Like, he doesn't look okay right now. He's been through some stuff. But I want you to know he's okay and he just wants to see you. And they were so excited. That's their dad. Um, and we walk in and all of their faces just went white, um, just scared to death. And I got to witness that. Tim has no idea what happened there, but I got to see that registration on my kid's face of this is not normal. This is a problem. And that's when all of my instincts yeah. kicked in like, yeah, this is it. Yeah. Yeah, because all of a sudden, and it's talking about the family system again, it isn't just about the addict and containing that behavior. It's about how it is affecting those children. And that sounds like that was that watershed moment for you where all of a sudden things are going to change. So did you give him, was there an ultimatum or what ended up happening from there? Um, well, he had passed out. They wanted to keep him for observations. And uh, the nurse came in and something in my gut just said, ask her, ask her if there was anything else in his blood. Because at this time, the police already come and drawn his blood. So it was done. Like it was in motion. Um, and she was, she was like, well, let's find out. And um, she ran or whatever blood they had already run. She said, yeah, you know, he tested positive for amphetamines and benzodiazepines, oh. which I have no idea what that is. So, you know, I'm the idiot wife. This is what I felt like standing there saying, is that something that could have been in his workout drink? Um, is that something that's in his heart medicines? You know, right. just you yeah. justify that codependent. Like, I got I to gotta make sense of this. Surely yeah. he would not lie to me. Um, and I confronted him and no, no, there's nothing. Mm -mm. Don't need to tell you anything. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, he, he left against medical advice, which is not something that I was proud of, mm -hmm. but I'm going to, okay, you want to get out of here? All right. Um, at this point, I can just remember you, you felt every emotion within 24 hours. Like you're grateful he's alive and, um, so thankful Mm -hmm. and happy about that but you are so betrayed and devastated and fearful of what is tomorrow going to look like i I'm, I'm a rule follower i don't i don't have a record i don't deal with police um don't yeah. know what jail looks like. so this is terrifying um he has a great family and they were very quick to just kind of equip us so his aunt was um, a district attorney in Fort Worth, and she was on the ready. we got to get you an attorney. It doesn't matter, um, you know, what's going to come out. The blood work could come back good for you, but it could not be good for you. So let's go talk to somebody. And he, she is somebody that he really, really respects. So he went. I drove him to the attorney's office the very next day. And um, he sat in a meeting with his aunt for three hours um, talking about what was going to happen or what could happen. Um, and they were like, well, you know, even if you don't admit that you have a problem, we recommend you going to AA and doing 90 meetings in 90 days. Um, and this is going to be $15,000 and we need a good chunk up front, um, you know, just to, just to begin the process. I was like, oh, yeah, because that's just, I mean, would it sell our soul like a kidney? Like, yeah, I'm going right. to go ahead. Yeah. Hiram. Let me ask you this. So at what point in all of this chaos and trauma did he realize, where was his breaking point where it finally hit him, changes got to happen regardless of anything else? Well, it was that meeting that he got in the car and told me, you know, he's going to start AA and he's going to find an attorney. Um, and he, I said, AA. And he was like, yeah, they want me to do 90 meetings in 90 days. And I looked at him 
And I said, well, is that because you have a problem or because you're trying to impress a judge, trying to look good? And he goes like, well, I want to look good. Like, I want to do the right thing. And there was a pause and, you know, my heart kind of sinks, but I'm not, like, you're not going to hear it from me. You're not going to, I'm not going to tell you what to do at this point because I just need a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, well, and obviously, you know, I have a problem. I have a drinking problem. I said, okay. Like, I've, I've heard this before. I um, don't know what makes this different, but okay. And mind you, we're down to one car at this point. So I'll make sure you get to those AA meetings if that's what you want to do. And so I did, like, the very next day. I mean, there's, there's meetings all the time. And so I was able to get him to a meeting like, the very next day. And, you know, I, I kind of butted out, let him have his process. And it was within a couple of weeks that he was like, yeah, man, I have a, I have a drinking problem. And oh. um, I'm, I'm really grateful that we have this group um, that I can go and talk to. And he started reading the, the big book. Um, and relating to some things, and, and it made sense to him to hear alcoholism in, in that verbiage, like it's an allergy. Um, right. Just can't hurt again. right. And did the dynamics in your family start to change? As he began to change, did it change your marriage? Did it change your relationship with your children? I will say that throughout the, that entire process, our children were pretty guarded. Um, they were pretty well protected. Like, yes, they had the memory of the hospital, and they got to see their dad kind of heal and his eyes blacken, but he returned to their dad pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, his attitude was obviously a little depressed, but he was always dad. Um, as far as the family dynamic between him and I, um, I was not doing well. I was not just dealing with the fear and the what's next and making sure that he still got to work at the bar that he was still working at um, and that he was getting to his AA meetings and that the kids were still um, taken care of. Um, but he was getting, like, better, it seems like. His, his, his whole mental um, persona and perception was changing, and I could see that. And he was getting excited and healthy, but on the flip side, I was having to walk this journey with him, and I didn't get a choice. I didn't get a say in, in the repercussions, and I was not handling it well. I was very resentful that he was, you know, tricking up, and I, I supported that. Of course I did, um, and I wanted that for him, but I didn't have that myself, and that was incredibly difficult. It feels like you were, so what, it, what I'm hearing from you is it feels like you were carrying everybody and everything. He isn't, he's moving towards recovery. You're taking care of the family. You're making sure people get places. And then you have the concern of when's the, when's the next shoe going to drop? And so how did you take care of yourself in all of this? Um, quite honestly, we were just in crisis mode, so you do what's in front of you. Um, we had a routine, and then um, the opportunity came for him to switch, switch jobs, switch fields completely, and it wasn't something that I had suggested. I kind of let him talk it out, um, and he finally made the choice to go into the steel, steel industry, um, which I supported, and so... He, he did that, and, I mean, we got into a rhythm. Like, this was shift work, so it was getting everybody up at 3.30 in the morning, getting wow. everybody in the car, driving from Italy to Midlothian, dropping him off, going back, sleeping for a minute, getting up for school. I mean, we just, we had our whole day. When school was over, you know, you go pick the kids up, then you go pick up the husband, and then go take them to an AM meeting. Um, like, I feel what I, about healing for you? When on earth did you yeah. heal? <laughs> yeah. I kept my mouth shut in everything with regards to him. But on the flip side, I had the most incredible support system. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, at the time, I think I was involved in church groups and mom's groups. Our whole life group came and supported us um, and especially reached out to me. What was interesting about it, like as, as important as they were, um, it wasn't, nobody understood. Like everybody that I was talking to, there was nobody that could look at me and say, 
you're going to get through this because I got through this. And so, like, I knew at this point something had to change. This was not a sustainable um, routine or pattern, and I wasn't getting better. And it was not something um, that I could talk to Tim about. So it was literally walking into church one Sunday and seeing that flyer on our seat about Celebrate Recovery, opening up this new group. Um, and I thought, okay, like, I see you, God. Like, this is where you're going to show up for me. Okay. Um, so I did. I, I went, um, and I was furious. Because in Celebrate Recovery, they want you to work on you. Um, and quite honestly, I don't have the problem. Or I didn't in 2017. Like, my husband's the addict. What, what do I need to work on? Um, but I, I really respected the leaders of the group that had just started. And it was brand new. And I wanted them to be successful. Hello, codependency. So I kept coming. <laughs> I kept coming, and it was slowly um, building those relationships with women that were spouses of addicts or children of addicts um, that you learn to kind of be introspective, and you start to you start to see where you're where you're confused or you're misinterpreting or you're doing something that's not helpful in the long run. Um, it was a pretty slow process, and there was a lot of denial, quite honestly, um, but it, it began to make sense, um, and then probably maybe three months into being there is when I started my first 12-step, and I mean, that's where everything just hits you, like you're controlling, Jackie, you don't trust not only God or um, your husband, but you don't trust anybody's perspective or um, advice, pretty much. And so, so, that, so that 12 step program brought you to a place that you are right now um, in terms of being, and correct me if I'm wrong on anything, I'm just reading this off of um, all the things you're saying in terms of being introspective, in terms of letting go of control in areas that you think you can control, but you really can't, um, and really being open to maybe being vulnerable in different ways um, that you didn't allow yourself to before. Um, does all of that resonate with you? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's, it's different, I think, for, and it took me a long time to embrace the 12 step because I'm not an addict and they want you to, to you know, to confront yourself and, and all these things. But what I was doing was I was, I was trying to control Tim's environment mm -hmm. in every circumstance. And that's why I couldn't find peace or heal because um, I was doing the impossible. Like Tim is going to make Tim's yeah. choices. His sobriety is on him. Um, it's and my this, job. This is the family system sober. right here is what you're saying. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just wanted no, to like highlight how important this is. This is addiction and codependency is that. It is, it is an interaction. It isn't just one addict isolated. It is it, you in your own way, as, as any codependent does, um, um, contributed to the addiction by by doing the behavior patterns that you did as the addict comes in and does their thing and so that's that's the whole point of this conversation is because I think a lot of people have that notion that it's their problem um, they're in a relationship with an addict and they think well they need to go straighten out and then come back to the relationship I'm fine um, which it sounds like initially that's how you were feeling absolutely if if you could give a message, say there are women out there, I'm imagining myself several years ago, even in my own situation, um, what is the message that you would give to someone who is on the verge of making the kind of changes that you had to make to get to this healthy space? What would you, what message would you leave us with? I would want someone to know that, um, like, if you don't struggle with addiction, it's going to be difficult to understand um, where your spouse is coming from. And um, it was pretty evident 
you know, pretty early on that Tim and I had to make alcohol the villain, um, not each other. And so we got on the same page as quickly as we could. Um, but it was something that we both had to come to our own realizations um, because there was a lot of hurt over the years, both ways. Um, so he had to come to his realization that his problem was his to, to tackle. And I'm going to support that. I'm not going to be um, the, the controller or I'm not going to tell him what to do. I'm not his parent. Um, but on the same flip side, I have to take care of me. And in the same way, when I first started Celebrate Recovery, somebody told me in the same way that addiction affects the entire family, um, not just the addict, recovery has the same effect and it affects family. Um, so I really embraced that. And I had to, I had to get over some embarrassment, um, some humiliation, some pride to widen my circle and find people that were in similar situations but had come through it to talk to me, um, to give me the heads up and, and the advice to just keep going. It's not something that you can just sit and wish away. It is an active process. Um, and there are people that are facing the same things that you're going through. You just have to plug into those groups because they're out there. And it's crazy um, how you want to hide this and you want yeah. it to be under you know, under the cover, just yeah. don't, don't address it, nothing. Um, but when you get through it and you can talk about it and you can be transparent and authentic about it, it is so much better. Like you get so much better um, in, in every area. Jackie, thank you so much for coming and just sharing your story because I know there are a lot of people out there watching and like you said it is a hidden problem people don't it's very hard to talk about but you have celebrate recovery at the avenue church in waxahachie and ennis you have discovery point retreat in waxahachie and ennis um please reach out for discovery point retreat the number is 855-916-3289 you can always contact alan rogers at the avenue church he is their recovery pastor, and I, I couldn't think more highly of anyone. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you to you. Thank you to the chamber. Uh, especially thank you to our viewing audience. Appreciate you all. Hey, thanks so much, Noelle and Discovery Point Retreat for uh, hosting this interview today. I hope that our listeners found it valuable. If you did, would you like and share this video? Uh, spread the word about uh, Discovery Point and the Avenue Church and the work that they are doing to help families, uh, especially right now. Thank you so much, Jackie, for just the way that you shared your story and, and uh, for, for serving that way. It's, it's really a blessing. So everybody have a great Tuesday night, and we'll see you next week on our final mental health and recovery series video. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye.